welcome to another edition of Sanctified Reason. Sanctified Reason is a podcast that sits at the crossroads of faith and pop culture with Dan Delzell and myself, Son Edom. And Dan, um, it's interesting times, as they might say, because it's a political season. We've got an election coming up in a few months. We've got uh, both tickets for the presidential election, the Republicans and the Democrats. And when you take a look at social media, the news, maybe talking to some neighbors, other people that you might know, it seems like everybody is putting their faith in politics. They think that one side is better than the other and one side is the savior. Now, granted, there is, in my opinion, a political party that would be better served for this country than the other. But a lot of people go to politics as that is it. I mean, we've seen it when Hillary Clinton did not get a pre- uh, elected president. The whole country, Democrats, melted down as if their savior, you know, let them, you know, got betrayed. And so politics, this religion of politics, it seems like everybody puts their faith in politics. Politics is their savior. And it goes alongside with kind of what you wrote in the Christian Post. Imagine having only politics, and I think there are a lot of people that only have politics, which makes it really sad for these people that put their faith and their religion in the world of politics because it's got to be quite disappointing. Oh, that is so true, son. And that's why in the article I made the point that it's hard for us as Christians, or at least most of us or many of us, to really fathom the emptiness in a person's soul if, let's say, the pinnacle of their existence is American politics. You know, of course, as Christians, um, many of us are uh, very interested and concerned about issues and candidates and the nation and, 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 and what's best for all Americans. Uh, you know, so, so we, of course, as Christians, have our, uh, have our thoughts on this and our involvement uh, in politics. But, you know, the point of my article was just simply to say, you know, imagine having only politics. And as we know, there are many people, like you just said, Son, where that is like their savior, uh, their, uh, their candidate. That, that's the closest thing they have to a savior because if they don't understand the spiritual realities of heaven and hell, of sin and grace, of uh, the need for repentance, uh, the need to be born again, uh, the need to be forgiven of your sins, then they're really not yet dealing with the most important need that they have. Uh, politics cannot touch that. Politics cannot forgive a single sin. But the death of Jesus on the cross and the blood that he shed, that brings the forgiveness that um, that every human being needs and that we as Christians ha- have accepted. We, we've receive Jesus as our Savior. We placed our trust in him. Uh, and, and yet we live in a world where, uh, of course, politics um, is uh, uh, very captivating. Um, as Christians, we only want what we believe is best for uh, our, our fellow citizens. And so, you know, many of us as Christians do have, uh, you know, perspectives on these political issues. But thankfully, we also have the eternal perspective, knowing that heaven is our home, knowing that when we leave this world, we're going to be with the Lord. And, and, and so American politics, uh, it's a very uh, temporary uh, kind, of, uh, kind of thing because it's always changing. There are always new dynamics. And, and we certainly see that right now, don't we, in this, uh, this current presidential uh, election? And, and just uh, all the stuff that that surrounds it. You know, one of the things that, as we delve a little bit deeper and and look at the church, one of the things that also becomes divisive in the church is politics. You've got people that will, let's say, be a Democrat, and the Democratic policies are abortion, are LGBTQ uh, ideology, you know, things that would go against biblical principles. And so when you combine religion and you combine politics, then it gets, I don't want to say tricky because it's really not, 
But in the society that we live in, the pop culture that we live in, it gets tricky because there's a lot of people that won't adhere to biblical principles and think that we should change biblical principles to match society. And so then they become not only confused in their religion and wrong in their religion, but then it becomes confusion in their politics. Because I, I swipe through social media and I see people posting things like, I'm a Christian, but I'm supporting Kamala Harris because of uh, reproductive rights. And it's like, well, how can that combination even match up? How can you think that supporting somebody who is pro-abortion, pro-killing God's creation you know, how is that even fathomable as a Christian to say and put those sentences, you know, in the same term? Because it's a difference between doing a sin or committing sin, because we all sin, but then it's another thing to actually support a national platform for a political agenda that endorses something that is completely anti-biblical and anti-Christ. Yeah, you really hit it on the head, son, because abortion, as you say, it is the taking of a human life. And, and as unfathomable as that, that is, to think that any Christian could ever support that, uh, when you think that, for example, um, there's a candidate running for, you know, the office of president who has not um, re- re- rejected late-term abortion. Now, that's just unfathomable um, that, uh, that there would be someone in, in favor of that. But, but, but all abortion, really, is... Um, something that that you know christians are very concerned about and um obviously if if the life of the mother is is at stake i mean that that's a different uh situation then but um you know that that's that's very few um and and so many abortions happen just simply out of convenience uh obviously and and you know they can say reproductive rights but what about the rights of the child what about the rights of the unborn baby uh, what about the rights of the little baby who, depending on when the abortion happens, um, in, in, in certain cases, the baby is going to feel pain, not to mention lose his or her life, you know, um, at the hands of the abortionist. Uh, and, and so it's just a terrible thing. You mentioned the LGBTQ uh, issue, and um, Christians are very concerned about those issues because, uh, you know, just, just because there are those who are trying to in essence, legislate immorality. And, and, and we certainly have seen this with the whole uh, push for gay marriage um, and really going against thousands of years of, of, of the history of the world and certainly, um, you know, teaching of the Bible, both Old Testament, and New Testament, when it comes to uh, same-sex uh, relationships. There is no such thing in the Bible as uh, same-sex marriage. There is no such thing really in, in the world. Uh, I mean, the world may define it that way, but but that's not the way God uh, looks at it, obviously. And, and then another one, Son, that comes into play with these politicians, and even like the the uh, the VP choice that was just announced today, uh, the governor of Minnesota. You know, they were talking on the news how uh, you know he signed legislation uh, for you know children to have uh, surgeries if if they decided that. Um, they wanted to be a different gender. In fact, there's a photo I, I saw today on TV. He's standing next to this, this, well, it looked like a girl, but I, I, I think that this person, uh, maybe it was claiming now to be a guy. It was either one way or the other, you know, you kind of lose track. I mean, were they born a girl and they want to be a guy or were they born a guy and they want to be a girl? Um, this, this individual had long hair, uh, and, uh, and so here was, uh, you know, Tim Walsh signing this legislation and, and it sounded like he was signing legislation that, you know, the child, uh, can make this decision. Like I think it was a 12 year old, even without parental uh, consent. And, and, and so these are things obviously that are greatly concerning to Christians, abortion, uh, transgenderism, um, the, the, the gay agenda. Now as Christians, we're called to love all people regardless of their choices or their lifestyles or their preferences or, or whatever they might define as their own orientation. Um, but at the same time, we need to speak the truth in love. And the truth of the matter is that everyone's born either male or female. That's the way God designed it. Uh, the truth of the matter is that God made sex for, for marriage between a man and a woman. And the Bible says, flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a man commits are outside his body but he was sinned sexually sins against his own body. So, um, so that is something that Christians 
you know, definitely are, are uh, you know, very interested in, in uh, promoting uh, just the truth on that issue and, and really not wanting to have the, the public schools involved in any way uh, dealing with those issues that should be dealt with at home. Uh, and then, you know, the abortion issue, as we've already touched on, uh, you know, the taking of the most vulnerable among us. Um, what, what, what could be, what could be worse than that? So, so these are issues that, that concern Christians. And, you know, as, as I wrote in a, uh, a recent article, Son, um, you know, really, uh, and, and I think the title was, um, uh, Kamala Harris and late term abortion. And then, uh, it said, um, a, uh, something abomination. I'm trying to remember the word, but it was, uh, something abomination. But, you know, I think you, you, you get the point. The listeners will get the point of that. But the w- one thing I wrote in there is that a vote for a late, uh, late term abortion candidate is really a vote for late term abortion. You know, I remember years ago, some you say, well, you know, you know, nobody should be like a one issue voter or whatever. Well, okay. Uh, but what if that one issue? And obviously, there are a lot more than that that people have uh, when they're when they're not going to vote for her. But um, what what about if that one issue is the destruction of life in the womb? Um, that's a pretty important issue. Um, so I, I think whoever came up with that idea, well, you don't want to be a one issue voter. Uh, probably somebody who was you know pro abortion, not pro life, and maybe even somebody who supported late term abortion. Um, so these are things that Christians definitely uh, try to apply the Bible to their to their views, um, to what they stand up for, what what they uh, try to help come about in this nation, so that um, babies can be protected, so that young minds can be protected from uh, transgender ideology, and, and and so that people who are struggling with same sex desires can know that there are those who've come out of that um, by God's grace. Um, nobody really chooses to have those feelings. I've, I've never heard of anybody, you know, who was like having heterosexual desires, which are the natural desires, of course. And then, well, I'm going to choose to have uh, gay feelings. But but they come from somewhere. Um, you know, obviously it gets pushed in the culture. We all have a sinful nature. Um, there are desires that come from our sinful nature. Um, God did not and does not create sin. So God doesn't create someone to be an adulterer or a fornicator or a, a thief or a homosexual offender, all these words that the Bible uses. Um, but that doesn't mean that a person with same-sex desires necessarily chose to have those feelings. But what they, what we all get to choose is what am I going to do with my feelings? On one hand, you might say, well, it's not fair that you know, well, whatever it might be, one, two, three percent of the population, let's say, they struggle with same sex desires. Well, that may not seem fair. I understand that point, but whoever said life was fair? You know, what about a child with cancer? They didn't choose to have that. Um, you know, all we can do as human beings is respond to what we're feeling, and unless we're going to seek to, uh, to, to live according to the good book, unless we're going to seek to live according to the Bible, well, then I guess you can just create your own truth. And that's kind of what's happened in society. Uh, many people feel like they can create their own truth. They can create their own morality. And, and we certainly have seen that with, with gay marriage. And there are even, uh, you know, churches, believe it or not, that uh, affirm that, which is just unbelievable and affirm transgenderism, um, and, and really almost seem to be more pro-abortion. So these are not churches that look anything like um, the church in the New Testament that, uh, that Jesus instituted and, and wants us to have. Um, if anything, they look like some of those seven churches in the book of Revelation, like the church in Laodicea, like the church in Sardis. Uh, this Sunday I'll be preaching on Jesus' letter to the church in uh, Thyatira. And uh, there was a, uh, a, a so-called, a self-proclaimed prophetess there. Uh, Jesus refers to her as Jezebel. Now, that may not have been 
her real name there in the New Testament, like the Jezebel of the Old Testament, who was married to King Ahab and, and was really an occultist and, um, you know, ordered the uh, extermination of God's prophets. I mean, she was an evil person and, and, and her husband just kind of, you know, the king, he just, um, he just kind of didn't do anything to try to stop it. Uh, so, so then in Thyatira, uh, which uh, Jesus wrote to there near the end of the first century, um, they were having their own issues with this so-called prophetess, this woman, because of her teaching. And it said her teaching was leading people into sexual morality. So it's not all that different song today with churches that, um, you know, there are churches that will have a wedding, what they'll call a wedding ceremony for a gay couple. Now that is straight out of the, the new Testament, uh, examples of, of, of the worst of the cases in, um, the book of revelation, uh, like Sardis, like, uh, Laodicea, where Jesus had nothing good to say about those churches. And then Thyatira, there was some good that he had to say, but then also some bad and, 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 and one of the things with the church in Thyatira, son, is that Jesus said, you, you, you put up with, 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 with Jezebel. And that's what Jesus called her. Uh, it appeared to be this, this woman there who was uh, teaching, really was um, more of an occult kind of uh, individual that had slipped into the, to the church there. It, it reminds me of the Judaizers in Galatia who were promoting uh, circumcision as necessary for salvation. And it was really messing up the church. In fact, Jesus said, who has bewitched you? You know, before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. And then Paul asked them, did you receive the spirit by um, observing the law or by believing what you heard? And, and, and of course, they, they received the Holy Spirit when they were born again by believing what they heard, not by uh, the law. So, you know, these are um, situations that have gone on in churches, son, you know, you know, thousands of years ago in the case of, you know, King Ahab and, and Jezebel, and then uh, near the end of the first century, you know, almost 2,000 years ago, uh, what went on with some of those churches in what's modern-day Turkey uh, Jesus uh, wrote those letters to these seven congregations in Asia Minor. And uh, the very one, like I say, that I'm preaching on this Sunday, Thyatira, they, they had people that were being led astray into sexual immorality. And we see that today uh, by those churches that are leading people into um, gay relationships where they're affirming that, you know, if you have these desires, um, you can, for example, you know, get married to this person and, and you can engage in that, uh, type of behavior. And, and it's, it's no different than what Jesus was rebuking there in the book of Revelation. Uh, what Paul writes, writes about in first Corinthians, they had, you know, these problems in Corinth there in the early church. And, and Paul wrote, flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a man commits are outside his body, but he who sins sexually sins against his own body. So what we're talking about today, son, obviously, is that within the politics of society, because there are people who have so interwoven um, moral issues with politics, um, this is why Christians then feel led, of course, to, to, to speak up and to take a stand. Now, um, there is no party that lines up with the New Testament church. You know, I, I was reading something recently, Son, where it was just commenting on how, you know, even the Republican Party, how kind of gradually as a party, it's become much more, um, you know, much more open to the idea of, of gay relationships. It, it kind of softened the position a bit on abortion but, but again, you know, that's the world. I mean, if we think that there's going to be a political party that is going to line up uh, with Christian doctrine, then really then that would be more of a church or a denomination, you know, but that's not the, the purpose of the Republican or Democratic Party. Now, now um, you know, the Democratic Party seems to have, 
uh, gone so far extreme. I mean, they don't even want the name of God in their platform, but how could you when you're going to promote transgenderism, when you're going to pr- promote gay marriage, when you're going to promote abortion? I mean, how you, when you're doing those things, son, there's nothing of the Holy Spirit in any of that. And so, um, you know, uh, uh, people who want those things are in a dark place spiritually, um, by and large. I mean, it's hard to fathom how someone could ever, you know, support those things and, and not be in a very, very dark place spiritually because those are so clearly against uh, God's word. Uh, God's word on marriage between man and woman is clear. God's word on, on life is clear. God's word on gender is clear. So when you flip all of those around and try and say that wrong is right, then you do what's right in your own eyes, then, you know, it's pretty obvious who you're listening to in the spiritual realm. It's not the Holy Spirit, but it's the, it's the enemy of God, you know, Satan, uh, who is seeking to turn people away from God's plan. Just like Satan, he wanted to be like God in heaven or be God himself. And he got kicked out of heaven because he got bored, apparently, of worshiping the Lord. And so what he's been doing ever since is coming up with counterfeit, counterfeit sexual uh, practices, counterfeit gender uh, ideas, um, you know, and then like you said, son, you know, coming up with this name, reproductive rights. Well, what is it? It's killing an unborn child. So somebody might call it something that makes them feel better about it. Uh, but, uh, yeah, it, 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 these these issues are not difficult, are they, Son? If we want to see, well, what, what would the Bible have to say about these things? Dan, as far as people that maybe they're not as politically engaged, um, a little bit more um, you know, to themselves, but they look at politics, they look at things that are going on in the world. I mean, we just had a stock market crash. A lot of money was lost. The Dow dropped 1,000 points in a day for the first time ever. You've got, you know, the Middle East is a powder keg with uh, Israel and Iran potentially going to war. You still have, mm-hmm. you know, the Ukraine thing, whatever that is going on. Um, you know, some call it a war, some call it money laundering. Um, you have the southern border wide open, which is leaving the possibility for another 9-11 style attack on our, on our country. Um, you know, you have Russia and China flying jets uh, into Alaska. And so you've got all this stuff, and there's a complete lack of leadership from our country. I don't care which side of the aisle you're on. There's just a lack of leadership. And so people are getting scared. People are getting concerned. And they think that the election is going to solve that. But, you know, as mm. Colossians 3, 2 says, set your, things, uh, set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. How important is it for us at this time uh, in our country, not only to be praying, but also to be reminded that, you know, Yes, there may be, in our opinion, um, and in uh, a political candidate that you know may be better for the country. Um, but ultimately, God's in control, and that's the person, that's the thing that we need to remember, that God is in control. He's the one that's going to be taking care of everything, and as long as we put our faith in him, we can't go wrong. That's such an important point, son, because as you say, these things are huge. I mean... Um, you know, the, the prospect of World War III, uh, you know, uh, people who have money in the stock market, you know, uh, you know, billions of dollars were lost just in that one day. I mean, but these are things that all are going to pass away. And it's why Jesus always warned against, you know, putting our confidence or our hope in wealth. Um, you know, Jesus said that these things ultimately are destroyed. Um, you know, they, they don't help us. You know, I, I often think of Warren Buffett, you know, right here in Omaha. And, you know, his billions and billions. But just as his partner, Charlie Munger, uh, passed away, whether it was a year ago, whenever it was, um, I mean, the day is coming when Warren Buffett will pass away. And his billions won't mean a thing to him. Um, the only thing that matters when a person passes away, when they die, when they're, they, they take their final breath, is, you know, am I right with God? And it was interesting, son, because uh, Laura Ingram was interviewing Donald Trump. And 
she asked him about heaven. And he said that, um, you know, he, 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 if he's good, he said, if I'm good, I'll go to heaven. And, and, uh, he said, well, if I'm bad, I, you know, he kind of referred to going to the other place, but there was no sense that he really understands that none of us are good enough to get to heaven. In fact, in Romans, it says there, there, there's no one good. No, not one. And, and so the only way we can be forgiven is to have the blood of Jesus cleanse us. That's why Christ died. Um, you know, uh, if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. And we know that's not the case. Uh, so we need the gospel. We need the cross. Um, you're, you're pointing out here, Son, that with all these big issues going on, what what can we as Christians do? And you, you mentioned the verse in Colossians, set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. You know, there's the verse in Proverbs 4.23, above all else, guard your heart, for it is the wellspring of life. So we do have to be careful as Christians, don't we? Um, that we don't get too consumed with all of the issues of the day. I mean, we need to be praying about them. And we certainly can be involved in trying to be part of the solution for these problems that are, that are out there. But, but the whole point of my article, Son, you know, imagine, um, imagine having only politics. How depressing would that be if, if we as Christians didn't have the eternal hope, the eternal assurance, the eternal kingdom, the inheritance the Bible says we have in heaven, it says it's kept in heaven, stored for us there. So a world war will not touch it. Um, no political election will touch it. Uh, no stock market crash will touch it. Not the inheritance that you have when you're born again, redeemed, justified, saved, and forgiven. When you are a Christian, um, you have an inheritance that is going to last forever. So that is, continues to be our need as Christians as we pray for these very big issues in the world, as we pray for America, we pray for this upcoming election in November, we pray for the Middle East, um, we pray for Christians around the world, we pray for people to come to know Christ, all of these things that we, that we pray for, and God wants us to be praying for them, underneath it all, we have a safety net, you know? Um, we can do all of this and not have to wonder, well, you know, am I going to get to heaven? Am I going to get in? Well, if your faith is in Christ, you don't have to wonder. The Bible says that your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. You have your reservation in heaven if you are a believer in Jesus. If you have received the free gift of everlasting life by faith, then you're the, the Lamb's book of life. And if it's not, then just think about the last time you opened a Christmas present. Think about how easy it was to just pick up that present or have somebody, a family member, that hand it to you, and you unwrapped it, you opened it, and it was yours. You didn't pay a thing for it. You didn't work for it. You perhaps didn't really deserve it, but it's a gift. I mean, who, who among us? deserves, you know, a lot of the gifts we get, that, that's not why they're given, because we, quote unquote, deserve them. They're given out of love and, 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 and care and so forth. But eternal life is a free gift. Now, living the Christian life is difficult. Living the Christian life has challenges. But on the front end, we are saved and redeemed and justified and born again and forgiven through faith in Christ. And, if, you know, if it wasn't that way, then the Father would never have sent the Son to suffer and die on the cross, you know, if righteousness could be gained through the law. So you said it exactly the way it is, Son. Um, this is why we're to set our minds on things above, not on earthly things. I mean, it doesn't mean we never think about these things, obviously. But, but the, the dominant thought that God wants us to have is um, thinking about what we have in the kingdom that Jesus has given us, you know, the Bible says the kingdom of God is within you.
So if you're born again, you're already in the kingdom. Um, you already have eternal life. Now, the very first part of your eternal life, it, 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 there's going to be some, some rough seas. There's going to be some bumpy roads. There's going to be some challenges. But I'll tell you what, you know, Stephen, the first Christian martyr, uh, was stoned to death. And since that happened about 2,000 years ago, there have been an estimated 70 million believers who have been martyred for their Christian faith. So there are a lot of bumpy roads in there, a lot of suffering, a lot of pain. But once they got through that, boy, they're loving it now in heaven. And they're going to be loving it there forever. So whatever you or I might be going through today, um, wherever you're at in your life right now, let's say as a believer, what, you know, you're listening to this podcast and maybe you're thinking, well, I got this going on and this problem in my life. Let me ask you this, if I may. Um, you know, are you being persecuted to the point of, say, shedding blood? Are you, you know, being put in prison for your faith? Uh, many, many are around the world. You know, so, I mean, we can always look at our situation and realize, you know, hey, if the Lord provided the grace for those believers, then he'll certainly do that for me as I look to him in faith, as I trust him. And, and I think Simon, one of the things that we do, we, we set ourselves up, you know, if we just assume, well, I'm never going to have any trouble in this life. Well, Jesus said in this world, you will have trouble. Now in heaven, no, there'll be no trouble in heaven. There'll be no unfulfilled desires, no pain, no death, no sorrow, um, no, no war, no cancer, you know, nothing. Uh, no fighting, no jealousy, no resentment, no bickering, uh, no financial problems. You know, everything we will have there that will just be uh, make it absolutely uh, fabulous. Um, and, and, and it'll be that way forever and ever. So, you know, it really shows, Son, that as the Bible says, I mean, it's got to be the devil that's blinding people from seeing this because, Nobody in their right mind would ever choose hell over heaven. Nobody would choose to have to pay for their own sins when you've already got somebody who's paid for your sins for you, if you just accept it. And then he'll come and he'll live in you and he'll, he'll start to change you from the inside out. But nobody in their right mind would ever do that. So there's something else going on here. And, and the Bible tells us that the God of this age, small g, the devil, has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the glory of the gospel of Christ. So we are in a spiritual battle every day, and um, there are so many who don't see the Lord as their Savior. Uh, they don't follow him as their Lord and Savior, um, but it's critical that we try to reach them, because if they die in that unconverted state, then their soul goes directly to Hades, which is just a, 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 one of the Greek words in the Bible for hell. Like the rich man in Luke 16, and he went to Hades. Not because he was rich, but because he made riches as God. And Lazarus was in heaven. The rich man was in hell. Uh, I should really say Hades. Translated hell, but the, the distinction is this. Hades is like the county jail uh, of hell. And there's another Greek word that's used, Gehenna. Gehenna. And, and that's the, the lake of fire. And in Revelation, it says one day death and Hades will be thrown into Gehenna. Into the, into the lake. Hades will be thrown into Gehenna. Um, so sometimes I've, I, I've wondered, sign, you know, Judgment Day, when everybody goes and they stand before the Lord. Now, for us, it's going to be all good because Jesus has forgiven our sins. But for those who are going to be judged according to what's in the book, um, in, in terms of unbelievers, that is, um, I, I've, I've, I've wondered at times, you know, what would that be like? I mean, you're in the prison of Hades, suffering. But then it would seem there's going to be like this brief little break where you get out, almost like the person in county jail. Okay, come on now. Let's go before the judge. And then you're going to hear your sentence there, and then you're going to go to the prison, you know, the, the prison of Gehenna, the prison of hell. Um, so, you know, it's all bad on that side of the ledger. It's all bad if you're, if you're paying for your own sin. That's why it's urgent. It's critical that you and your loved ones today turn to Christ, repent of your sins, place your faith in Jesus, and then 
the Bible says you're going to have on a white robe there and you're going to be standing before the throne of God and, and with, with, you know, millions, billions of other people, you know, worshiping the Lord. Um, these in white robes, who are they? And where did they come from? These are they who have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. And so if you're listening to this podcast today, if I could encourage you to just pray a seven word prayer, if I could only give you seven words, I would encourage you to pray this prayer today. Wash me, Jesus, with your precious blood. Wash me, Jesus, with your precious blood. So as you turn your heart to the Lord, ask the Lord, wash me, Jesus, with your precious blood. You know, ask him to forgive you. Ask him to cleanse you. Ask him to come and live in you. Ask him to fill you with the Holy Spirit. Um, That's the only way any one of us uh, get that white robe. That's the only way any one of us avoid Hades and Gehenna. That's the way any uh, that's the only way any one of us can can understand that, yes, judgment day is coming. But for those of us who are in Christ, which is just a way of saying, you know, you're a believer, you're in him, he's in you, uh, you're a Christian. Um, it's not, that's not going to be a day of sadness for you. Um, you are going to be welcomed into uh, God's eternal glory uh, through your Savior, Jesus. And, and, and so, Son, if I was going to sit down with Donald Trump and I have a, have a really calm, respectful conversation about this with him, I would really encourage him um, to really consider uh, no longer trying to be good enough to get into heaven. God, of course, God wants us to try to be good. But if we're not born again first, if we're not saved first, if we're not redeemed first, then all we, that, that's only religion. That's just not jumping through hoops, and it won't work. Oh, you can go to Judgment Day with your laundry list. God, look at all these things I did. It doesn't mean a thing. The Bible says our righteousness, that is, if we're trying to save ourselves, is like filthy rags. And that's why no one has ever worked their way into heaven. Not one person. You only get in by grace. You only get in through the cross. Even the folks in the Old Testament, people will say, well, how were they saved? Well, they believed in the coming Messiah. You know, the Bible says Abram, that's Abraham, but Abram believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. So he got in through faith, um, by grace. Now, of course, Christ hadn't come yet, but they were looking forward to the Messiah. Today, now, we look back 2,000 years to what Jesus did on the cross. And, and, and Christ died for sins, the Bible says, once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous to bring you to God. And when you put your faith in the cross, when you put your faith in the blood, you are cleansed of your sin. And, and there's no amount of politics that can do that. There's no politician that can do that. There's not a single politician. I don't care who it is. Abraham Lincoln, Ronald Reagan, anybody who's ever lived, George Washington. I mean, you name them. Um, there's not one who could have died to forgive even one of your sins. It requires a perfect, sinless Lamb of God. Just as John the Baptist said when he saw Jesus coming, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So that's the opportunity you have today, my friend. Run to the cross and then pray for your loved ones and friends and neighbors that they too will run to the cross. Because if all they have is politics, if all they have is the Olympics, if all they have is their their, their, their stocks and their bonds and their retirement fund and their vacation and their home and their car, if that, you know what is that? What good is that going to do when you take your final breath? It won't do a thing. So Christ uh, is the Savior of all, but especially of those who believe. Uh, He died for all, but you don't receive the benefits unless you repent and believe the good news. And then God brings you on his team as the Holy Spirit works that miracle of the new birth. And that's why Jesus told the religious Pharisee, Nicodemus, you must be born again which simply means uh, brought into God's family through faith in Jesus Christ. So, Son, I think there's a very relevant uh, discussion we're having today with everything going on in politics today, everything going on in the world. But praise God that we are in a kingdom um, where the Bible says we are not of this world, meaning um, ultimately our home is in heaven. Christ is our Lord, our Savior, our King. And we want to keep our eyes on the Lord, even as we go about, you know, everything we do with our family, our job, 
politics, sports, hobbies, you know, you name it. Home construction project, a vacation, you know, attending a sporting event. Everything we do, if we're not Christian first, then we might kind of start to slip away from the Lord the way some of those folks did uh, in, in Revelation of those seven real congregations Jesus wrote to, you know, some 30 years after they were started as churches. You know, you got to figure they were, you know, all in at the start. But in some of those places like Laodicea and Sardis, I mean, very, you know, wealthy areas, and they kind of got caught up in the wealth and everything else. And before you know it, they were losing that fire for the Lord. In fact, Jesus said those in Laodicea are lukewarm. He said, hey, I wish you were cold or hot, but you're lukewarm. He said, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. So this spirituality, uh, you know, for the Christian is a very fluid thing. And we can either cooperate with the Holy Spirit on a daily basis by trying to say no to ungodliness and worldly passion, saying no to temptation, which the Bible says God's grace teaches us to do by praying, by serving others, by helping the needy, by worshiping together, uh, by reading the Bible. I mean, all of these things help us to, to not put out the Spirit's fire. That's what the Bible says. Do not put out the Spirit's fire. You know, but, but, but we, can, we can just seek to live for the Lord. And as we do that, son, the Holy Spirit keeps the fire going. And um, it's a beautiful thing. So we just have to be careful. We have to be alert. But um, in a world where people are just falling off all over the place into transgenderism, into LGBTQ uh, ideology, into abortion. Um, and then, son, you've got other, you know, you've got some, some Christians and also some professing Christians who are getting all off into, let's say, judgmentalism. You know, I mean, that, that's just as much of a sin, let's say, as, as transgenderism, right? Um, so neither one of those. God wants. Uh, he, 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 doesn't want, he doesn't want people to get caught up in either or gossip or lying or stealing, you know, or lust or whatever it might be, greed. So, um, you know, politics is one thing, but imagine having only politics. Oh, son, how depressing is that? Yeah, Dan, one last question when it comes to uh, Christians that go to church and are, let's just say, more genuine Christian, but not so active in things. You know, the Democratic Party is uh, huge on religious discrimination. We saw it during the uh, Obama administration with LGBT lawsuits against florists and uh, cake makers and uh, T-shirt makers and that type of thing. And then during the pandemic, we saw, you know, uh, governors and Democratic mayors and governors in L.A., California, New York, you know, crack down on churches like John MacArthur trying to shut them down, uh, synagogues, you know, shutting them down. Um, Kamala Harris has a huge uh, hostility towards, you know, Christians and religious liberties. Is it important mm -hmm. to for Christians to really consider and be active possibly in this election because you have the possibility of extreme religious discrimination and persecution coming if she becomes elected? Well, I think there's a very strong case to be made, Son, that, um, that because Christians want justice for all, um, I mean, we realize that ultimate justice only comes in God's eternal kingdom and, and in the world to come. I mean, there will be justice for the Hitlers of the world, but not only that, there'll be justice for those who deny and reject Christ. Um, but, but you're asking a very important question, and, and that is what role should or could Christians play when you've got candidates who are uh, coming out against uh, Christian liberty, coming out against um, uh, the freedom of, of children being able to survive in the womb without having uh, someone invade them? Um, you know, Christians are concerned about what um, Russia has done in Ukraine and, and what abortionists do when they invade the womb and, and, and what people have done to try to redefine marriage. Um, I mean, uh, you know, what, what, what parents and some parents and some teachers do when they try to brainwash uh, children or the culture tries to brainwash children about gender issues. So, um, you know, for, for Christian son, you know, it, it, it you know, I know, think about it this way. The world, all they, their only um, paradigm is politics. 
Um, but for us as Christians, we see it through the lens of, of, of the gospel, of the Bible, of Christianity. Um, we don't look at these things, uh, you know, as like, you know, political issues per se. We look at them as what is going to, to honor the Lord and help people. Um, and in our nation with a Judeo-Christian heritage, uh, can we do with voting, with speaking up, with standing up for the truth? Um, you know, when Christians do this, son, this is just part of our responsibility to take a stand for justice. Um, you know, um, so I say, well, you know, Christians, you know, you hear people say, well, Christians shouldn't be too involved in politics. Fine. Don't be involved in politics. Just be involved in all the moral issues that God says uh, need to be addressed. If the world wants to call those things uh, politics, which they do, um, fine, let the world call them that. But, but you as a Christian can approach those things realizing that, that there's a, high, a much higher calling than a, a, a political calling. You as a, a Christian have been called to help, um, help the light shine in the darkness. Uh, help the oppressed, uh, whether it be babies in the womb, uh, whether it be children under the oppression of transgender ideology, whether it be people who are under the weight and sin of fornication, adultery, or LGBTQ ideologies. I mean, whatever, you know, everybody's going to maybe have a little bit different calling in that sense. I mean, you know, you'll have some Christian son who who feel led to work with, um, you know, unwed mothers. And, and with um, organizations that, uh, that are involved with adoption or others that are involved with organizations that are trying to make legislation possible to protect the unborn. Now, some of you might say, well, that's political. Well, the Christian would say, well, you can call whatever you want to call it. Um, I just love Jesus, and I just want to help protect these babies, or I want to help protect these children, or I want to help to make sure that we have a, a, a secure border so that the terrorists aren't getting in, which we've learned now in the last couple of days, what, um, the current administration, what, what, what was it, 99 or, or you know, there's a, a large number of, of terrorists, 60 some maybe, that, that they released back into the country. Now, Christians are concerned about that, song because that's a justice issue. Um, that can bring harm to people here. And so Christians say, well, I want to vote in a way. I want to speak up in a way. I mean, some Christians say, I want to be involved, you know, as a candidate or supporting uh, a candidate, not only with my vote, but, but with, you know, uh, in other ways, financially or in other ways. So these are all things son, that Christians look at. And, 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 and we look at them uh, through a different um, prism. We look at them through a different lens. We look at these things and we say, this world is about God and it's about people. And, and I'm, I'm here to serve the Lord, um, but I'm also here to help people. And, and um, if there are laws um, or uh, people in office who are doing things that are hurting people, then I, as a Christian, am going to try to, um, in, in, a, in a peaceful but very active way, try to address that you know, with my voting, but with, 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 you know, talking about these things, promoting these things being involved in these things. So, I, you know, I, I think the world, son, wants Christians to believe, and, and we hear this, don't we? You know, Christians, you just stay over in your little box, in your religious box, and, and we'll, we'll take care of all of these decisions. This is politics. This is, this is a stupid. But you know what, son, that, that's a con job. That's not true. Um, of course we need to be involved um, because we're called to be involved. Now, our main calling is to spread the gospel, okay? So in everything we're doing, and that's what I love about like Franklin Graham, for example, you know, he'll speak out on, on all of these issues, but he's always sharing the gospel. You know, when he's interviewed by somebody, he always shares that, you know, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son so that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. Or, or he'll give some, you know, short version of the gospel, like that's John three sixteen. But my point is, it doesn't have to be either or. Um, you know, Christians, our first calling is to reach the lost and disciple the saved. We're called to assist the needy. But, but a lot of times, um, being involved in issues the world views only as political, um, whether it be, you know, abortion, whether it be, uh, you know, transgender uh, indoctrination in the schools or whatever it might be. Um, and, you know, son, we're seeing that, like, for example, Oklahoma, where the governor 
um, you know, signed the law where uh, they, they, they want to have, have the Ten Commandments now uh, back in the schools to, to try to show young people that, you know, y- there is um, ultimate truth. Uh, and our nation was founded with that uh, understanding. Um, you, you can't just define your own truth. And that's where we get into a lot of these problems, even the ones we've talked about today, Son, whether it's uh, transgenderism, LGBTQ issues, abortion, um, other issues. When people um, do what feels right uh, or looks right in their own eyes, um, then that's where things go off the rails. So, um, you know, we, we, we do have to be careful as Christians uh, in, in, in how we go about these things. But um, the world would like to you know, not involved. And, uh, you know, a huge mistake. And I mean, hey, son, hey, you know, Nazi Germany, um, how many in the church remained silent as, you know, Hitler became stronger uh, in, in terms of, of the power that he had? And where were the professing Christians? I mean, of course, you know, there were, um, you know, Dietrich Bonhoeffer and others, um, you know, who, uh, who stood up. Um, you know, uh, Corey Ten Boom and others, but I mean, where were the thousands, hundreds of thousands of professing Christians who were, um, you know, standing up and saying, you know, we are not going to let this happen to the Jewish people, and uh, and 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 so, um, it is interesting. A little side note, son. You know, one thing today they're talking about is that, um, you know, this the, the other guy that was being considered Shapiro in Pennsylvania, who's Jewish the VP role for the, the uh, Democratic uh, ticket, um, they're saying now that, you know, he really had to try to really downplay his Jewish heritage because there are those in the Democratic Party who, who would never have wanted to have a Jew on the ticket, which is really sad, you know. Um, and, and so they're saying, he you know, he wasn't chosen for that, but, but he's probably going to be embarrassed now that um, it was probably a test for him in a way, son, you know, when, when he was maybe down to the final two, knowing that there are those in that party who did not, the last thing they would want would be have a Jewish person on the ticket. And, and so, and I didn't really follow it too closely, so I don't know, uh, from what they were saying, maybe he, he kind of tried to downplay that a little bit. Well, now they're saying he's probably going to regret that he did that. Um, I don't know. I, I don't want to... Um, you know, speak too much into that. But my only point with that is uh, for the Jews, um, we, 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 we do it manifest itself um, even in, um, even in, in a lot of the politics, obviously uh, that, that, that are going on. And so, you know, we, as Christians, we want candidates who love all people, black, white, brown, you know, whatever your race or religion, um, that's our calling as Christians. And uh, it, it's pretty sad that you've got, you know, a, uh, one of the two main parties in the country who, who really seem to be, you know, very anti-Jewish, which is, you know, very sad, but uh, we won't, we won't spend any more time on that. But uh, yeah, just a lot of, a lot of great stuff to talk about here today, son. Yes. And it will be interesting to see moving forward where this all goes, but um, ultimately, you know, November 5th, we will see what happens in our country. Dan, thanks so much for your time and your insights on this. And we appreciate it. And uh, we look forward for many conversations ahead, God willing. Well, thank you, too, son. I, I feel exactly the same way. And thanks for all you're doing with, uh, with your podcast. It's just an honor to be, uh, to be able to partner with you on it. And, uh, yes, indeed, we'll look forward to many more, many more discussions. We'll just ask the Lord to, help us, uh, to address those things, whatever he wants us to address. And uh, you can check out our website for other past episodes as well, RadioWarp.com. That's Radio W-A-R-P, RadioWarp.com. Just click the Sanctified Reason podcast logo, and all of our past shows will pop up. You can also uh, pretty much listen anywhere you listen to podcasts or just do an Internet search of Sanctified Reason podcast, and we pop up. You can also email the show. Sanctified Reason Podcast at gmail.com. That's Sanctified Reason Podcast at gmail.com. And so for those of you listening, hey, thanks for listening. Do tell a friend. And until next time, God bless.